For the last few videos now, we've been studying the special type of second order differential equation, the homogeneous and constant coefficient, a times y double prime plus b times y prime plus c times y equals zero, and we've come up with a way of solving it involving an auxiliary equation that we get out of this differential equation, which is a times some r squared plus b times r plus c equals zero. We've gotten that then if we plug this into a solution, y equals e to the e to the rx, that plugging in the two values of r that you get from this this uh, characteristic equation, you get two solutions, y1 and y2. I don't know why I'm writing g, y1 and y2. And your general solution, again, that g comes up here. OK, perfect. Your general solution is c1 times e to the r1 times x, that first root, plus c2 times e to the r2 times x. And if r is a single root, then r1 and r2 are, this, are the same. So you want to multiply this in by an x. But OK, the purpose of this video, after this little review of what we've done, is to note the case in which we have the complex roots. So again, this is when our auxiliary equation, our characteristic equation up here, when we graph the parabola that it makes, if that parabola has no real roots, as this parabola has, then we get that it has two complex conjugate roots. OK, so what does that look like? What it looks like is that r1 is equal to some real component, which we can call alpha, plus i times some complex component. And again, just thinking back to what the quadratic equation actually has, this is a plus or minus. So this is the plus case. And then the minus case is r2 is the same real component, but then minus i times the same imaginary component, so just the negative. OK, given these two roots, if we just plug them in into our general solution, we'll get a bit of a wacky result. So we get, if we just plug and chug, that the general solution equals some constant times e to the alpha plus i lambda. And wait a minute, I don't know why I'm using lambda here. I should really probably be using beta, given that I started with alpha. So alpha plus i beta. All right, let's just be consistent here. Alpha plus i beta, alpha minus i beta. So alpha plus i beta times x plus c2e to the alpha minus i beta times x. OK, first off, what does it mean to take something to the power of an imaginary number? And second of all, is this even a solution still? Does this does this extend to the complex numbers? All right, let's go one by one. First, what does it mean to take a complex exponential? So what does it mean to say e to the power of 2 minus 3 times i? Well, we can break this part into two things. We have e squared and then e to the negative 3i. We can This is the property of exponentials, addition or subtraction in the actual exponential can be turned into multiplication. OK, e squared, we're good with that. We know how it's done. So really, all we're asking a question about is taking an imaginary power, e to the 3i. There is an amazing formula, Euler's formula, however, that for complex numbers states that e to the i, so some imaginary number, times theta, so just e to the sum imaginary number for theta real, that this is the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta. So somehow, imaginary exponentials equal this almost a complex circle here. And if you want a lot more intuition on that, I highly recommend checking out 3blue1browns channel on YouTube. It has some amazing intuitions. And if you don't know how to spell that, that's 3 blue one brown, numerals included in the channel name. And he gives some good intuition for this. But OK, I'm going to assume you understand why this works, how it works, at least how. 
All right, if we take that and we plug it in, what we get is that the general solution is some constant times e to the alpha times x. Now we're going to break it apart. So now we have uh, this here. This part is going to be e to the i beta x. If we plug in beta x as theta, then what we get is the cosine of beta x plus i times the sine of beta x. And if we then plug in the, uh, not plug in, but if we account for the second term, we get c2 e to the same alpha times x times, now slightly different, we get the cosine of negative times beta x, but cosine is an even function, so that won't really affect it. And then we get, now we have this a minus, but the sine is an odd function, so it will affect it. We can just pull the minus out. We get minus i sine beta x. Okay, if you didn't know what I was doing with that minus sign, what we had was sine of minus beta times x. And sine is an odd function, which means that around the origin it flips. So if it is doing some fun stuff up here, it does the exact same fun stuff but negative down there. So if I knew we had a negative value, we can just take this negative sign out, make this plus, make this negative. All right, hopefully that made sense. Now, uh, just so you know, this form up here, the general solution with the complex exponentials, that's a totally valid solution. I'm just showing you how to simplify it down. So if we continue on our quest to simplify, what's our next step? Well, let me make a little dashed line here so we know what we're doing when where. We get that the general solution is, seems like we can factor out an e to the alpha x. We have it on both terms here. We have an e to the alpha times x times, and I will switch colors for this portion. We have, and let's let's uh, multiply the c1 through, c1 times the cosine of beta x plus c1 i times the sine of beta x plus, do the same thing for c2, c2 times the cosine of beta x minus c2 times the sine of promptly not giving myself enough space, the sine of beta times x. All right, let's scroll down a little bit so we have space to algebra eyes. If we consider this again, notice cosine of beta x, cosine of beta x, and sine beta x, sine beta x. If we take things out and simplify once again, what we'll have is e to the alpha times x plus, or not plus, but times, excuse me, and now we factor out a cosine. So we get the cosine of beta x times, and now we have c1, I guess I'll change colors once again just to make it even more visible, c1 here plus the second one is c2 plus c2, okay, and then plus the sine of beta x times, and now we have this second thing here, we have the i times c1 minus, and then i, okay, I forgot to carry down an i there, minus i times c2, and let me just be consistent with my coloring. All right, now, what do we notice about this? c1 and c2, they're arbitrary constants, so what we can say is c1 plus c2, that is another arbitrary constant. c3, i times c1 minus i times c2, that's generally the same as i times c1 minus c2. c1 minus c2, this is obviously an arbitrary constant, we could call it c4, is i times c4. But if we're going to stretch the definition of an arbitrary constant, we can say arbitrary constants can be complex numbers. They can be imaginary. So really, this c4 times i is just another constant, c5. And this is the fruit of our algebra. It's that the general solution, in the case when we have complex roots, complex roots, that this solution is going to be e to the alpha times x times some new constant, 
C uh, three, I'll call it, I guess. C three times the cosine of beta times x plus another new constant, C five times the sine of beta x. And don't get thrown off by the subscripts here on my constants, C3, C5. These are just arbitrary constants. And in fact, probably it'd be better if we use C1 and C2, but I already used them up there. So just remember, C3, C5, arbitrary constants. You can call them C1 and C2 when you haven't already used C1 and C2 on the page. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we have this general solution. And in the next series of videos, I think I'm going to do some example problems for these homogeneous constant coefficient second order differential equations. But I hope you see we have each of our three cases covered now. In the first case, we have two distinct real roots. That one was pretty simple. We just had, so in the case, whoops, so, well, what am I doing? Okay. In the case where we had two distinct, two distinct roots, well, really what we had is that the general solution was just some constant times e to the first root times x plus some other constant times e to the second root times x. But in the case where we had complex roots, this is almost like a subpoint, is then in the case where we had complex roots, what we had is that we can simplify this all down to the general solution is equal to e to the real component of the complex roots times x times some constant, which I'll call now, I guess, c1 times cosine of your imaginary part of your root, beta x, plus c2 times sine beta x. And remember, these are different c1s and c2s from our arbitrary constants up there. And if we had only one, one double root, a double root, then we're left with the, the, the general solution is c1 times e to your only root r times x plus c2 x itself times e to the r x and we proved that in the previous video. So with all of our different cases we can nicely box up our theory of constant coefficient homogeneous differential equations. And like I said I'm going to do some exercises in the next videos.